Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast this evening and delighted to welcome Ben Rosenblatt and Martin Evans. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Hello. Thank you very much for coming on. Part three of an unofficial FA three-part series. <laughs> Starting off with Bryce a couple of weeks ago and then Ben and, uh, sorry, Peter and, and Chris and then uh, you two guys. So thank you for coming on. I'm going to come to you first, Martin, because you're top of the screen. A little bit of background on you. <laughs> a little bit of background on you, uh, education-wise, what you did before the FA and where you where you are at the FA. Yeah, cheers, Rob. Um, so currently at the FA, I'm a physical performance coach, um, primarily serving the women's side. Um, prior to that, I was working at British Cycling for six years as the lead strength and conditioning coach there. And then before that, um, multi-sport in the Welsh Institute of Sport. Um, and so worked across a wide range of uh, kind of different sports within uh, the Commonwealth setup, um, ranging from uh, badminton to boxing to wrestling to shooting to swimming to cycling um, and probably a few others that I've forgotten, which was a great kind of opportunity for um, trying some things out and learning my trade. And then before that, I spent a couple of years working in um, age grade rugby um, like developing players towards uh, regional rugby at the time. Um, and that's probably actually where I first met Ben. I wasn't an age grade rugby player. <laughs> Welsh age grade, age grade rugby player. Nice. Over to you, Ben. Yeah, well, I can start backwards then. So I can talk about when me and Martin first met. And... That'd be cute. Nice. Yeah, first, thank, massive thank you for having us having us on, Rob. I think that... Oh, pleasure. The um the people that you have on here, we like listen to it every week, and you learn so much from the the type of people that you have on. So thank you very much for inviting us on. Um, sure. you. The um so I start my, my career started um yeah probably similar to other yeah other people you've had on here like very very average sportsman realised that it wasn't going to work out for me. Um, so. Um, Went to went to university study in at Cardiff, met well Ewick as it was then, and that's where I met Martin. Actually, I became really interested in strength and conditioning, and Martin very kindly allowed me to come watch one of his sessions for the age grade rugby players, and we took a loop of the the rugby pitches and had a good chat about, chat about training, and we've probably been doing the same ever since. Um, Which at high school? There we go. <laughs> Um, so uh, yeah, started to work with some track and field athletes, and you know, I know uh, listening to a lot of your your guests, you talk a lot. They talk a lot about building a sort of portfolio of work, and that's definitely what I did. And I know that Martin did the same. We were studying and um, working with the tennis team, uh, track and field, rugby team, football team, um, and then went from there to when I left university, I started my PhD part time. Um, and then started took a job at the Olympic Medical Institute and started to consult at different football clubs like Millwall and Cardiff City. Um, and then I went on to be head of fitness and conditioning at Birmingham City um, when I was far too young and incompetent to, to take that on. And um, after two seasons there, um, I left and joined the uh, intensive rehab unit, which was set up between, uh, based at Bisham Abbey, set up between British Olympic Association and English Institute of Sport. Um, and that was an amazing experience, similar to Martin, where we just had hundreds of different athletes from different sports with different injuries coming through and working in a multidisciplinary residential rehab centre to try and solve their problems and work really collaboratively with, you know, with the, the, the national governing body that were looking after them. Um, so after that, I took on the role um, with GB Hockey, which is when you and I last spoke, Rob. Yes, it was, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, to, uh, worked with them through to 2016. Um, throughout the last 10 years, I've been involved um, as strength and conditioning coach with um, Olympic and Commonwealth level judo athletes as well. Um, and now chairman of the Camberley Judo Club. And I got my PhD in 20 something or other, 15, uh, 14 maybe, just before, um, yeah, before coming to work at the FA as physical performance coach on the men's pathway. Nice. We spoke to Bryce. Well, I spoke to Bryce about this, and I'm sure it's something that comes with conversation all the time. The the depth and breadth of experience across your team is very impressive with the with the guys that you've and girls that you've worked with along your careers. How important do you think that has been for you guys as a team to have all those 
like you said, Ben, the portfolio of experiences? I think what's interesting, and I'm, I'm sure Martin will have a maybe similar and different perspective, is but what I find what I find interesting is that everyone has, um, like you say, a real breadth of different experiences, but we all seem to have come across prim, um, similar and common principles. And I think that's from having to try to have a positive impact on different environments and still trying to, you know, affect physical performance in different environments with different sports, different populations, different people. And you kind of learn through that way what the, the common principles are, the common threads that allow you to be successful or or not, as the case may be. So I think that the, the breadth allows some common principles to emerge and the, the, the broader people's experiences, the sort of my experiences, the more common the principles they share tend to be. What would you, what would you say, Martin? Yeah, no, 100% agree with that in that, like that's one of the real strengths I see as of our department um, is that real breadth of experience which identifies those principles. But then within that, each of us have um, a depth of knowledge in a, like a smallish area and that expertise helps broaden out like one pillar of uh, kind of like the structure and strategy that we put together. And I think those two combinations are critical. I, I've never worked in a physical performance, strength and conditioning coach, whatever we're called these days. Like I've never walk, worked in a team that big, like the maximum I ever worked in was three people. And so you're going to be limited by the breadth and also the depth of knowledge in a number of areas. So you have to look outside of your, um, your kind of sphere then. Whereas within ours, we can look within our own circle in order to find the answers to the problems that we face in the majority of cases. An ability to be challenged or have your perceptions challenged really, you know, and really interrogated well. Some of the stuff I've believed about strength training um, moving into the role, I don't believe anymore as a consequence of, you know, yeah, having some really, really good discussions late at night at SGP with Martin. What, what an, an example... Second, second. second line in the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> what well, any examples, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so look, when I definitely when I first stepped in, I, I, I thought if we could get all these guys um, heavy back squatting once or twice a week, it would probably solve eighty percent of the problems uh, that we that we've got. Um, I, you know what? I, I probably believe the same to some extent, but. I I, I don't believe that to be true anymore. And I think that we could do different things to solve 100% of the problems that we see. Um, and I think that a better understanding of the specificity of the demand that the players are facing, um, the nature of the types of stresses we need to place through them in order to facilitate the adaptive response we're looking for. Um, and, and, and Martin's absolutely challenged my thinking around there and shaped, shaped what I believe or what I understand, I should say, to help me program and plan for the for the players that I work with. I mean, ultimately, sorry, mate. No, go ahead, Martin. Like, ultimately, strength is is specific, and like we as a as an industry use strength as a kind of global nebulous concept. And like, when you look at any of the kind of classic texts, like Verkashansky and Sif and all those things, strength is the ability to apply force under specific conditions we very rarely define our specific conditions. And so that's, this was a line of thought that um, the team that I had at cycling, we started on because cycling is quite unique in that it's a primarily concentric activity. The amount of time you have for force production changes depending on um, the kind of number of revolutions per minute and the gearing you're on. So like when we're looking at different riders, we're trying to think about how can we optimize their force production capabilities for the event that they do. So if they're having to go from a standing start up to 160 RPM, they've got to produce force in all those conditions. And like, that's a really, like it's a really simple model in cycling because it is primarily concentric and it's around hip and knee extensors. But then you start to think about that idea and that some of those kind of principles and apply them to deceleration. And you're like, you're in a different ball game <laughs> as to how you would try and change that. If you were going from that idea of the most effective and efficient way of doing that. And that's what it comes down to for me is how can I maximize that athlete's performance at the, the minimal cost? Because there's so many things placing 
like a stress or a cost on them like and we're one small part of that whole pie like how can we do that in the most effective and efficient way that's really similar to the experiences and this is one of the times when our careers passed when i was working at the rehab center as well and again that when we, you're working with an athlete for a really short period of time we've got to find the thing that's most efficient and most effective um how you know how can you help that, that you know the quad hypertrophy in a really short and effective period of time and be really effective within the, the rehabilitation so the kind of reverse engineering of, of outcomes is something that martin and i used to speak about before we worked at the same place as well mm-hmm. I'll, I'll stay stay with you ben just for a second now come to get get martin's opinion on this uh as well but you mentioned about your i think you get young and incompetent when you're at Birmingham, <laughs> Birmingham city ben um why was that and what's what's changed since and what were your initial observations when coming into international football so two three three questions in there well, what, well so first one is why am i incompetent well no why are we incompetent then thanks rob yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i think that um what one of the one of the and i've reflected a lot on that and it's one of the most formative experiences i've had within my career and one of the um, mistakes I made was trying to put a training model or physical preparation model in place, um, independent of the environment that I was operating within. And I couldn't understand why other people didn't share my perspective of the world. Um, yeah, so I, I think that when I came to ask more questions and listen to the answer and trying to interpret them into what, what that could mean for a physical preparation model, um, I, you know, I didn't like some of the answers I was hearing, so I ended up pushing the model e- even further and even harder. So I think I think fundamentally that was a critical mistake, and, and I see that reflected. Um, you know, I see that happen in, in a lot of people, and I've got to be conscious of some. I've got to be absolutely conscious of that throughout now and throughout the rest of my career as well. Which you know, building back to Martin's point earlier and the question you were asking, it's, that's why it's so important to be surrounded by people who will challenge you. And then you have, and being able to be receptive to that level of challenge as well. Um, so I think that, that that was a critical mistake that I made. Um, there were lots of other factors, you know, at play within that particular situation. But it was also an enjoyment, an experience I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, um, and I wouldn't change for the world. So, um, what what were my observations when I? I suppose I can't remember question two, but I remember question three in. Uh, I'm still stuck on why why are you so incompetent? But that yeah, <laughs> I've yeah. written a list actually. <laughs> now let's let's jump to three. There was two in one on the first one. You've you've yeah. you covered that. That's not <laughs> why are you incompetent and why are you really incompetent? <laughs> yeah, so observations uh, when we first stepped into uh, into international football again, having worked in professional football and having worked in um, Olympic sport and consulted in professional football in different environments and different stages as well. First observation I made was, I made was, I suppose the variety of demand that the players were facing within their club environments. So if you look across the pathway from 14 years old, all the way up to seniors, you've got some players that are playing on a regular basis, some players who aren't playing at all. Some players are playing up age groups. Some players are on loan. Some players are sitting on the bench. Um, then you've got the other dimension of club f- um, physical preparation models um, being really, really diverse and different. You know, there's the German method, the Spanish method, the English method, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we believe in this, we don't believe in that. And then that changing throughout the season as well. So that was that was one observation. The second observation I made was around um, how often on camp and across the age groups, we were having to modify what was taking place on the pitch um, and the constraints that some of the players were under. So we were having to, you know, he probably can't complete this session today or he probably shouldn't train today, he needs to rest. Um, You know, this person always has two days off after a game. And coming from um, more recently a combat sport background um, and the hockey background where we had to prepare players to um, compete eight matches in 13 days, it was all about how can we keep these guys on the pitch and training for as long as possible. Um, so that was, um, for me, that was a real a difference that, that I'd observed. 
And I suppose the third observation, I suppose, yeah, the third, I suppose, difference is, third observation is actually just the level that these guys were performing at was, was exceptional. And the quality um, and the, the kind of conditioning to the specific activities or the bandwidth of activities that they were they were competent in was just incredible. Um, and I suppose the, the, you know, huge credit to the clubs because these, you know, the guys in the clubs have been working so hard to push these guys with, um, enable, to enable them to compete at such a high level um, and to have some of them having some really outstanding physical attributes. The, the fourth observation that I made was that, that I suppose that the demand that they were facing at international environment and some of the differences between that and the club. And the idea is that, well, regardless of the philosophy or the model they're training in, regardless of the volume of work that they or, you know, the type of schedule they're on before they come in, when they come into an international camp or a tournament, we're still going to have to knock out five, six, seven games within a 20 day period sometimes. So the demand doesn't change and, and, and the levels of performance are exceptionally high. So myself and Martin and the rest of the team became really, really curious about um, how is it that we're able, we, we, yeah, how, how can we support these players to be able to cope with this huge jump and increase in demand or, or shift in demand, I should say, um, independent of the experience that they had coming in. Now, obviously, some of the biases that I had from the prep break, the environments I'd worked in previously, orientated more towards physical conditioning. So the experiences we've had around players being fitter and stronger, um, tending to recover better and tending to be able to cope with high levels of you know, higher volumes and higher intensities of training. So that was an area that myself and Martin and the rest of the team became really, really curious about. Same to you, Martin. Initial observations at international football. Yeah, For someone yeah. that, did you, you haven't worked in football? That was not been new sports. Okay, interesting. No, I worked in rugby prior as a team sport, but um, at a kind of age grade level. So yeah, very different experiences coming in. And similar to what Ben said, I I came from a program that we had uh, continual access to the riders throughout the course of the year. We had very few major competitions in a year, so kind of four or five competitions. So a completely different model in terms of that classical kind of preparation into competition idea. We probably had eight months of the year to prepare to compete, whereas we've now come into completely the reverse. And something that's always stuck with me is on um, the first couple of days I went to the building, um, I met with Dave Redden, who was at the FA at that time. And one of the things he said to me was international is different. And at the time, I was like, yeah, I know, like, but it wasn't until like you get into that journey and start to unpick some of the complexities that Ben's talked about and you realize how different it is because it was a completely different experience to what we were used to in that we didn't have that access. And that's one of the big, I guess, challenges that we faced is that we all thought that physical preparation was important, but we didn't actually have that much time with the players to make that because when we're together, we're actually going to compete to win. So, like those two things don't usually go hand in hand. I know when I was going to cycling competitions, we would train hard. Then we'd look to put in some kind of like transition period where they could adapt and then go and perform. We didn't have that window. So we had to think completely different about this problem that we, or challenge that we faced. And it was that, that was probably one of the most um, rewarding experiences is, is almost that enlightenment moment where you're like, ah, oh, I'm thinking about this entirely wrong. And I remember when I came in, I was like, well, we'll just do this, this, and this. And similar to Ben, is like, we'll apply this model and we'll be fine. But that was like so much work that was outside of um, like what we could actually control. So then we had to kind of change our mindset to approach that problem and define the problem differently as well. How long did it take for that light bulb moment? I don't know. I can't remember. I remember it was quite a while in. <laughs> like, Are we in a hot tub? Yeah, probably in the hot tub. <laughs> Like we, we definitely had conversations about elements of it, but like, I don't think we'd really put it all together because like Ben said, like using the squatting analogy is like, we knew that if they just did something consistently, that that would like probably solve some of the, the challenges that we were seeing. But the crux of the issue is we couldn't just get them to do that consistently because that's not, that's not what we were there to do. 
And so then we had to think differently about, well, what, what can we influence in the time that we have with the players? Um, and how do we go about that? And that was, yeah, that was a really kind of rewarding experience, I think. Ben, I don't know how you feel about that experience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, it, it certainly took a while and I think you have to live it a little bit to understand it. And I think it's, and the, the, and you see that when new people come in or <clears throat> to work within the programme as well, you see them going, and this isn't just physical performance coaches, but other disciplines, including coaching, who are used to working with players on a day-in, day-out basis. You know, they apply that you, you go in and you apply the same thing that has worked up until that point, and then you realise that you're in a very different different environment. You know, and it's definitely shifted the way I think about physical preparation sessions when we're on camp. You know, my my job when I'm on camp, unless it's in a tournament, is to develop certain, not just me, but the rest of the physical performance team. Our job is to inspire, you know, inspire, uh, empower and um, influence the players to be able to change some of their physical preparation habits um, back within their club environment. You know, our, our ambition is to make sure when a, pl a player comes back to the club the, and to a club PPC, the, the club PPC is licking their physical performance coach, licking their lips. They're going, brilliant. This guy wants to, this guy, this girl wants to work with me. Because I know that we would all have in next, sat in, you know, having worked in the club environment before, you really want to work with the guys. You go, come on, Ben, how can I get faster? How can I get stronger? How can I become more robust? And pitch up and commit to it with the intensity and consistency that they require. So we definitely see that as across our physical performance team as more of our role now is to establish environments and tasks which inspire and change players' mentality towards their physical preparation rather than what you know whilst retaining the consistency of their ongoing work um without you know yeah which is slightly different towards putting on a training session to maximize their intensity for to develop a given stimulus i know you've both spoken about the the, the philosophy and the methodologies that you thought you would bring into the role and maybe had that light bulb moment but in terms of how you see your role and you just mentioned there ben about allowing them to go back and be down to get in the gym and, and speaking to the physical performance coach and saying, yes, let's do this. I've done this. I've been inspired. Did you both or either of you think that that would be such a big part of your role when you go into international football or not? No. <laughs> no, not at all. Like, yeah, when I, when I applied and when I started, I didn't think, I didn't think I would go on the journey that I've been on in terms of trying to understand the environment that I work in and trying to come up with models um, that would be complete, not completely different because that's still part of like every day sort of um, in cycling, for example, that you still need the athlete to buy in, but you just have a much longer time to do it. I guess the critical difference is uh, rather than the 300 days per year I was with a rider, I might only have 50 days with a, a football player. And of those 50 days, I might only be in the gym like 15 to 20 times so then when you start thinking about that just from a contact and each of those contacts might only be 20 minutes like it's not a lot of time <laughs> so like how do you how do you kind of um invest in that skill set of dialing up your coaching skills i guess essentially um establishing an environment where they can engage with the session and they get like they get that kind of the the thirst to want to do it more and more um whereas in cycling that was much less of a kind of like um, uh, outcome of the session, essentially. Similar for you, Ben. Yeah, I, I'm I was reflecting on that quite a lot, and uh, yeah, sorry, you caught me daydreaming about my first day walking into St George's Park. But um, I suppose I, I, I understood that you know something which I understood coming into the role was that you had very limited time with the players, um, and then I also understood having worked in football previously that there was a a different culture around physical preparation than some of the other ones that I experienced um, in, in in different environments. Um, but I also understood there was a period of time that, you know, again, the advantage of having worked in Olympic sport in particular is you're looking at the competition, the big competition at the end, uh, the one with the shiny gold thing hanging off the end of it, so that you can kind of orientate your planning on a more annual basis rather than just preparing for the next game. So I suppose when I came in, I, I kind of understood those those three principles. I suppose what surprised me was that the 
across the pathway and particularly in the younger age groups that the education that some of the players had had around physical preparation and their kind of literacy and understanding of, of it. So a huge credit to, you know, the, the clubs that have been preparing them at that level. Um, and then again, maybe to higher up and towards the, the senior, towards the senior level, like the disparity between, um, yeah, I suppose the types of training activities that we would understand as important to improve somebody's ability to tolerate something and, and, and what they were necessarily doing. Um, I'm not talking about the senior team. I'm talking about up to, you know, the, the more 18 to senior phase of the pathway. So, yeah, when, yeah, I suppose those are the th things that surprised me, but I suppose the outcome or what it means doesn't necessarily change. We still need to understand the environment they train in and the, con and the conditions and constraints that the guys working in the clubs are under on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think the, you know, the thing I really tried to invest in was getting to know those guys and getting to understand their environment as well and fundamentally working out where I was getting in the way and where I could support and help and similar with the rest of the, the team as well. And then, like you said, making sure that the sessions that we're delivering on camp were really about changing a mindset and shifting a mentality and then being really, really clear with the clubs uh, around what we are trying to achieve and what we are doing on camp. So you've mentioned that one of your one of your, your four that you mentioned uh, coming into the, coming into international football was the demands on them. So when it comes to demands of competition, is there a gap that exists between the demands of the competition and what they're actually these guys are actually capable of? Well, I think the. Um... I suppose when we look towards what the demands of the competition are, that they, you know, they're, they're going to be unique to what the player is experiencing. That we know in most scenarios, a player, what the player is experiencing within their club season. If you look at a tournament in particular, like the the, the level of opposition is only going to increase. The time between games is decreasing, and therefore, you know, the fatigue levels are going to be increasing. So you definitely have a mismatch of of demand and potential for performance um which by the way is common in a lot of you know what i'm explaining there is similar to any tournament of, across any sport um i suppose what we became interested in is whether there there was a gap or was a difference in the capacity and capability um to be able to tolerate the training that was required and the and to be able to handle the competitions so i suppose what you know, if, if we weren't having to modify players on a day-to-day -day basis, if the players were able to train with the intensity uh, of the, the match demanded, and James Hairsign and Rich Nakedhead have done an amazing amount of work within that space as well, um, yeah, and they were able to compete and I suppose not just survive but thrive within that environment, then we would know that they were more physically that they had the physical capability to cope with the demand that was being placed on them. But, you know, we weren't making those observations. Um, and so we would, so we became interested in whether there was a gap between physical capability and demand. Um, and that's what led us down the route towards trying to in, put in place a profiling system or to, first of all, I'm trying to have a, some principles like what are the physical demands they're going to face? Can we measure them? Can we measure a player's capability to cope with and, and handle them? Um, and then can we provide in a tournament some solutions towards any gap that might exist? And can we provide a reference point for the clubs to explain and articulate what, what our observations are and to have a really meaningful conversation around player development, you know, accounting for the fact that 300 days of the year, the, the players are training within that environment and being completely respectful of it. Anything to add, Martin, on that? That's a pretty comprehensive answer, to be fair. And I guess like the... The key things we're thinking about is first and foremost, can that player survive? And I guess to steal a little bit of um, Nassim Taleb's kind of anti-fragile idea, can they thrive in those kind of really stressful situations as well? Because I think that would be ideal because like Ben said, that competition level only gets harder as you get closer to the end point. Um, so like you're going to need to start thriving in that because you need your best players to be firstly available, but then secondly, to be able to step up to the plate in that moment where it matters, which might be the 120th minute or whatever. And then they need to be able to deliver what they need to deliver in that time. So I, I think that's a really like unique problem in many ways, but then it has many parallels to um, 
I guess, some of the things that clubs are facing at the present time with congested fixture periods. Um, so there, there is like those parallels now and like potentially it's a very similar sort of scenario. Um, but there are many ways of kind of going about trying to solve that. I've got a very simple model that I view physical preparation through. Um, and this seems to have held independent of the environments. And I know it's something that Martin shares as well. It's like, can they cope with the demands of the training that's required in order to perform at the highest level? So can they do the volume and intensity of sports specific training, which is going to allow them to the players to develop or the athletes to develop? Um, and then what tools or things can you put in place to know whether they're doing that or not? And then what to, tools or solutions can you put in place to help develop them towards that? Then can they cope with the demand of competition? Because every, you know, each competition within each sport is completely unique and different. So you can really understand that. I and mean, then can you physically prepare them for that? And I think once you've been able to put those two things in place, you're then able to have a, a brilliant conversation with the coach and the athlete around what's going to change the game for you, what's going to, what's going to, you know, what's going to make a huge and significant impact on your game, on or on the team's performance. But I think you've got to earn the right to get there by being able to tolerate the training to start with, then tolerate the competition demands. And then you can start looking at some of the more interesting and exciting stuff around you know, improving players' capacity to you know, affect game-winning moments. And I think sometimes we can all be fo a little bit focused towards the game-winning moments without improving their capacity just to tolerate you know, the grind you mentioned the, the profiling system. Is that something that you can expand on or, or not? I don't want to put you in a position where you feel like you have to say something that you don't want to. I'd be delighted to, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then, yeah, just give us a bit of context. How, how you know, the, the process of that you went through to develop that system, why you chose the things that you did and, and where that leads to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we did was we tried to gain a lot, yeah, building on the commentary that I've spouted off just before, one of the things we tried to understand what we try as a we got into a room and we bashed around what are the what are the coaches telling us? What are our observations? What are we hearing from the players? And it came down to this theme of coping with the repeated high intensity actions that they were going through. So we what we tried to do was break them down into okay, well, what demands are we seeing? And one of them was around uh, breaking characteristics. So what are like, you know, are people getting stuck in the mud? Are they getting really, really domsy um, after heavy, you know, uh, or are they fatiguing during pressing actions? You know, th these are all characteristics associated with, um, you know, so these are all, you know, signals of some, you know, people are lacking some of the breaking characteristics or their breaking capability. If they got an ability to uh, absorb large amounts of energy through their lower limb, Secondly was the sprint in demand. So it's really, really clear that the game's fast um, and everyone's going to have to sprint at some point or other. So again, the question was, do the players have the capacity to cope with the sprinting that they're, that they're having to deliver on a you know, session by session, game by game basis? Um, and then the third or final one was the one which is kind of most pertinent to the tournament, which is we termed it repeat and recover capability. But the idea is that could you repeat these actions you know, moment after moment, session after session, game after game, and what are the characteristics which which underpin them? And then the, the other part of that is what can we actually do within our environment? Because we have very, very limited time with them. Um, we have limited hands on deck as well. Um, and so we have to come up with a profiling system that gives us some information around the players' breaking characteristics, sprinting characteristics, or capability to cope with breaking capability to cope with sprinting, the capability to repeat and recover, for, you know, re repeat work and recover from it between matches. Um, but the tests have got to be done. They, the tests can't really leave anything on the players because they might have to go out and train the next moment or compete within a day or two. And they've got to take place within a really short, usually a half an hour window, get the whole squad done within half an hour because that's the only time that you have in the camp because, again, the, the physical preparation isn't the most, or physical profiling, isn't always the most important thing to take place within an international camp. Um, so we consulted um, some experts around the world. Uh, we spoke with uh, Tim Gabbett to understand how profiling could support that. We spoke with Dan Cohen 
Uh, we spoke with Damien Harper. We spoke with um, JB Moran. We spoke with Gareth Sanford. Um, and later, and uh, later on, we start to sp uh, speak with Jonas as well. Um, and the idea was that what tests or what assessments could we use within our environment that would be reliable and valid and give us an indication of that. So we we started to look at the counter movement jump for breaking characteristics because it's a maximal change of direction task and the output being to you know project your center of mass as high as you possibly can. It's something it's you know not the best assessment of braking capability, but we can do it within about we can get three jumps done within about thirty seconds to a minute. It's reliable, uh, and we can look at so if they're jumping as high as they can. We can have a look at some of the kinetic variables that will underpin that. So we chose to look at eccentric mean power, um, and my God, me and Martin debated that for probably a year. Um, and we have found that players with high levels of um, eccentric mean power, greater braking capability, do tend to recover faster between matches. Um, and they are the ones that are slightly higher graded and particularly defenders as well. And we've looked at a whole host of other counter movement jump variables as well and slightly different within the women's game, but certainly on, in the men's pathway, players with that, that higher level of braking characteristics are, are better able to recover and uh, better able to, uh, they tend to be the higher graded players as well. For sprinting, um, we looked at the um, a measure of, again, okay, quick, dirty measure of hamstring strength. So we used the Nordic curl, um, and the prone ISO. We used the um, continue to use the Nordic curl on the women's pathway, um, but we don't use it on the men's pathway because of tolerance. They simply, uh, if throughout the pathway, there's not as many players doing it as a, on a consistent basis, and we're finding it was having too much of a negative impact. So we just looked at prone ISO. And then we looked at the repeated hop um, as a way of just measuring reactive, re reactive strength in, uh, index, so the capacity around the ankles. Um, the ability to generate stiffness around the ankles. And then with uh, the repeat and recover capacity, we looked at two concepts building on Gareth's work, which is, well, sorry, we looked at the concepts from Gareth's work, which was the anaerobic speed reserve. And the idea that your ability to cope with high intensity actions and to be able to recover from them is going to be geared around how fast you are and how fit you are, essentially. So players with a higher, um, you know, me and Martin speak a lot about Icarus, you know, the, the, the Greek god who float, flew too close to the sun. Whenever you play a game or whenever you repeat a high intensity action, the closer that action is to your physical limit, the closer you are to the sun, the cl closer you are to being burned. So that, that's the way that we viewed that if you can have a high levels of maximum speed and high levels of max aerobic speed, which we measure with a flying 20 and a, and a 1K time trial, quick and dirty, um, then we can give the player some indication of their of their ability to cope with an upcoming tournament demand. Um, so again, we're able to feed that back to the players, to coaches, to clubs. What we try to do is put those assessments in strategically. So when is the best time to do that throughout the season? And, in, and when, is the, when, when are the coaches most interested in that information? And when can that information be most impactful uh, for conversations that we would want to have with the player and the club as well? Anything to add there, Martin? Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's covered most of the bases there. Um, yeah, I mean, like going back to the start of it, it was uh, like profiling and training is probably some of the most um, things that we hold dearest as like physical performance coaches. And so there was so much, um, I guess, idealism to start with. And like, I'm probably the, one of the most guilty of that. But then we start that realism filters how we thought about it and like that's how we ended up at that point and we we actually spent a day where we presented our ideas for each of the different tests in like a kind of dragon's den style day and it was an intense day because everyone was at each other's throats about it and was like that's a crap test this is a great test you should do this and that and other but i think it was such a valuable process and it goes back to where we started this conversation around the importance of the the, the pod in order to do that there were 10 of us in a room, I think. And I like, like the ability to, for each one of us to kind of add our own experiences and insights to help shape this. And then for us all to collectively buy into it has massively helped with the success of implementation of that across two pathways, which um, at the minute is how many teams on the men's side at the minute? Eight? Dan? Yes. Eight teams on yes. the men's side and five teams on the women's. 
Like, so the ability for us all to kind of buy into one system, whereas some of the issues that maybe we faced before our team got together were each team was doing slightly different um, kind of assessments because it was a consultant based model of delivery. So each of those teams um, had a different assessment battery. They moved up an age group and then it's a completely different assessment. So that ability to track across time, like we were unable to do. Whereas what we have now, we have a system where we're able to like look at how players um, progress across, through the course of their careers from under 15s all the way up to seniors, which I think gives us much more power in the long term. <clears throat> I guess less than I learned from that experience was the there was three key, key ones. The collective power of different people's diverse thinking was just enormous. That the old proverb of moving together but moving slowly to move together and moving fast but moving alone i learned that very very hard uh, that i learned that the hard way um and I, I think it was a hugely valid that was a hugely valuable experience and then the ability to step detach yourself emotionally or detach your own personal opinion from a concept and be able to allow it to be critically appraised and see what works for everybody but still have the capacity to defend defend the space where, where required um, were three really, really key lessons that I learned within that. So like, I really believe in that. You really believe in that. Are we both able to detach ourselves from uh, our emotional connection to it and then see what is actually the best thing to do? Taking the time to have that discussion and, and moving together um, and then listening to everybody's perspective on it was really, really important as well because it has to work for everybody. But it took a long time to do, which for people who know me will know that's uh, that would, would have been a real challenge. I'd, I'd re oh, go on, Martin, were you going to say something then? Yeah, just um, as a follow-up as well, like I think the reporting system that we've built off the back of it as well is also critical to the success of it because we have um, like a, a FIFA-style um, shield which displays the player's results. Um, and that, going back to another comment that was made around the the inspiring and influencing piece, they get their, their card, which could be on their phone or it could be a PDF or whatever, and they can see it and like they've got an instant connection to it and they've been educated through the system to understand what each of the components mean. And then they've kind of got this as they're, they're, they're right in front of them all the time, which I think is so powerful. And equally, like when we're speaking with the coaches, it helps with, like the consistency of the message and the conversation because whatever ppc is working with a coach they having the same conversation because it's the same system and it's based on this piece of information that they've got should, should probably say at this point it was rich aiken ed james rodeo and emmanuel fajimalua who developed those and they did a most amazing job of it yeah. and emily kane who's doing in her final year of a phd now um who's investigating whether players with better developed physical characteristics measured through this system um, do cope and tolerate, do cope with tournament football, do tolerate tournament football better than, than others. So we are testing the assertions or the assumptions that we're making and seeing whether they stand the test of, you know, of rigour, um, yeah, through, uh, through M's PhD. And we're hoping that we'll change something off the back of it. I'd written down challenge. A little well, right at the start, actually, because if you both mentioned it, and I, I thought I'd lost the, the opportunity, but I'm glad I haven't because you brought it up again. When you say the Dragon's Den style uh, scenario, was there any particular way that, that was guided? Because I, I can imagine people listening to this going, "That that sounds pretty brutal," but in a in a in a constructive yes, be brut been brutal, but in a constructive way. Was there any guidelines around that of how people should put their point across or how it should be delivered what did that look like don't do it under fatigue because i remember as people got tired that's when like the kind of emotional uh less constructive responses uh came out i mean it was quite a like, a bear pit, What's that? like a bear pit by the end of it than a constructive debate <laughs> yeah so allow plenty of breaks uh to keep people uh mentally fresh and i guess just framing it in the way that it is constructive feedback and like, yes, we hold something dear, but like Ben said, it's being able to detach yourself from that emotional attachment to something because without that, it does just become a bit of a, 
a mudslinging contest, um, which isn't what it's about. Like, I think constantly reminding people of what the end goal is, is to have this system that we all um, collectively buy into and support, because that will give us great more, much more strength as a department moving forward to support all the teams that we're looking to support. And it also, like in hindsight, makes the whole reporting thing a lot easier because if we all did different things, there's no way we're going to have a like a report that is the same across all, which again helps that whole buy-in piece and and kind of the collaboration with other departments, not just internally. I, th I think one of the things we've learned is the application of session design principles into different environments. Um, so as S&C coaches, session design coaches in, in general, session design is something which is um, something which, which we all care a lot about and all think a lot about as well. So not just around sets and reps, but how we're going to make people, how we're going to design a session or an environment to make people feel a certain way, how we're going to improve somebody's ability to deliver more intensity within this, how we're going to challenge that person there. And we construct and design a set of scenarios or constraints to be in, to enable people to achieve those outcomes that we set. So trying to take that same mindset or mentality towards designing a session like that is something that I is something that I the way I try and approach it. So what the outcomes we're looking for, what are the behaviours we're expecting to see, what behaviours don't we want to see, and what's going to encourage them or discourage them. So you can put rules on things like it was like you can only present for five minutes but you know you have to present as passionately and you know vigorously as you can for five minutes and then you can ask quite there's if things go on tight tangents you can put it in the parking lot or you know put it on a posting nut and slam it on a wall and say well you know come back to it later so things down top having a facilitator or a moderator who is out of the discussion but facilitates it is really really important um and then the questions yeah, there can only be th you can like put rules on things like can only be open questions. Do you remember on that day as well that we also did push ups for any word that you couldn't define? So you weren't allowed to say things like strength, you weren't allowed to say context, you weren't allowed to say fitness. And if you did say them, it was a stack up of press ups at the end of the day. So that you actually had to really define and articulate what you were trying to what you were trying to say. There was a good few press ups at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Being, who was who was the most brutal? In the world? It was probably just me and Martin at each other. I think it was. Yeah, when we say everyone else, it's just me and him going hammer tongs at each other, especially when we get tired. <laughs> um, we did also have uh, an external in that meeting. I remember as well, who was um, very kind of like clear and calculating in like what he believes in and stuff and provided us um a degree of external rigor as well which again was challenging because we hold those things dear and um it's hard to take that but yeah like all those principles and that was one of the early meetings that we had and like i think we've come a long way since then and some of the meeting structures that we have to achieve the outcomes are probably more refined than that initial one i guess one of the things we were did miss out there was the idea of going away from our base at St. George's, so a neutral venue, so it doesn't like that. And there's a bit of a collective, there was a meal associated with it and like a few beverages, obviously. So just like that kind of unity as well, like a surrounding it. So you may go to war in that meeting in a constructive way, but then after that, there's dinner and like you're all back together as one. Like so me and Ben had a drink at the bar after that and we're fine. It's like, the gentleman's handshake in rugby after you've just knocked someone's teeth out, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah. you know, the way we were trying to play is we want it to be the best that it can be and you have to be constructively challenging. Without that, you're not going to be the best that you can be. Bryce has got a, uh, a statement that he uses or a phrase that he uses which resonates really, really strongly with me, which is strong beliefs weekly held. So, you know, you don't just, you know, flip in the wind to whatever the shiniest thing is. I mean, there's two, uh, there's two mismatched metaphors there, but the, um, the you know, you, you have a, you think critically and, uh, and develop a belief yourself. And then you're willing to have that challenged and torn to pieces. And I think that if, if an idea is, or a concept is robust enough, you have to have the courage to allow it to be torn to pieces. Nice. Next thing, 
we've spoken about the physical side. How does all how does all this link into what's going on the the technical coaching, technical and tactical coaching side? Come to you, uh, Martin. Yeah, I mean, from a women's side perspective, I can't comment too much on the men's. What we've tried to do is um, there's a how we play model, which is the England way. And what we've tried to do is co-create that with the technical team so that there's a like a massive degree of integration. So I guess the easiest example is around um, we want to play in a relentless pressing manner. Um, so that obviously comes to that breaking strength concept. So what does that mean from their end? What, do, what are they looking for? And like how does our information help um, figure out what that player might or might not need? And that starts a really good conversation then, which kind of flows into the the um, individual development like process we're starting to initiate now as to, well, this is what the technical coach's observation is and this is what I want them to do. And then this is how they look on from a profile and perspective. So between that, it allows a good um, shaping of what that player might need to then go and work on in order to be capable of delivering what that technical coach sees. Um, so that's kind of it from the women's side of the minute. It's quite early stages of that process. We've been working at it. They've been working at the how we play side of things. We've been working at the physical profile and capability side of things so that we can get to that point where they merge together for a more integrated model rather than it being you're not fit, but yet you can last like six games in 19 days or whatever. We need to last. Like We're trying to put that together to make sense of it. And some of the most interesting discussions are whether those big discrepancies in the observation of what the player can or can't do and the physical profiling so if the player is um, is not capable of doing it, but the profile suggests they are, then it starts a really different conversation to the flip of that. You can potentially, if they're not capable, you just need to raise capability a bit and they, they, they might be capable of delivering what they need. Whereas in the reverse, like it's probably like in the, using the breaking strength example and pressing, do they understand what they're meant to be doing? Um, and kind of like starting the conversation differently. So hopefully we're getting to the, the outcome that we want quicker. I suppose on the, the that there's a really nice example of how we're working with goalkeepers at the moment as well, which is, um, so Tim Dittmer, who leads the goalkeeping department. And, you know, if you're looking for a diverse guest, he's certainly one I would have on. Uh, he's got a great approach. He's got a you know, fantastic coaching and a clear, a clear model of goalkeeping that him and his team have developed and a really good and interesting approach to coaching as well, um, which I think a lot of strength and conditioning coaches would be would find really valuable to listen to. But anyway, he's developed the DNA characteristics. So some of the characteristics which him and his team feel, are, you know, the attributes that you require to be a World Cup European Championship winning goalkeeper. Um, and the four physical attributes are having... Um, physical presence, um, being an efficient mover, being robust and having um, a unique physical attribute. So by talking with the coaches and unpicking what those things mean to them, we're able to align some of our assessments towards those things. So we can then start to have those conversations more directly, which is, you know, physical presence, we're using the count and movement jump and um, repeated hop for, and we're looking at hop height and jump height. And we're saying that when they need to, again, part of their model is, um, defending the goal and defending the space, defending the area. Now, obviously, when you're defending the goal and defending the area, the time constraints are shorter to be able to demonstrate physical presence. Um, so we look more towards how high you can hop versus when you're defending the area, the time constraints are longer. So we look more towards the counter movement jump and how and how able they are to project themselves under those conditions. And again, trying to see how things correlate. You think they've got great physical presence. Um, we've tested this and we've seen that they've that there's a gap in their ability to produce force or project themselves under these uh, conditions of constraints this is a real strength of theirs we can really leverage and push this further um, or equally this could be a development space for them as well um, so the, so I suppose the message from both myself and Martin around that is around trying to align with what the what the coaching model or the yeah the game model or the coaching model is the, the other side of that is then making sure that the coaches that you're working with have got a clear understanding how you a clear understanding of how you feel that you can support their you know the the more global ambitions so 
do they when you know to make sure you're talking the same language do they really understand what what breaking is and how what it means to us and then what it could mean to them so that then they can make an informed decision around how they choose to use that information is there any other, other challenges for that that integration i mean there's there's language um there's people's i suppose people's protection of their own of what they know like this is this is the coaching realm that's that's your realm is there any other am i right in that and is there any other challenges for this integrated model with the coaching side i think i first start by saying the with with the coaches that we work with you know throughout the pathway is that they're you know they're open-minded people, and and they they genuinely want the best for the the players, and they want the best, and they, and they want to produce teams and play, you know players and teams who can win World Cups and European Championships now and and, and for the future, um, and that they've got a they're educated and they've got an understanding around, you know what the, there is a physical demand to the game, and that there is a requirement to be able to cope with it and to perform within it. And they understand the nuance and the complexities in the environment better than anyone. Um, I always feel that whenever we say as strength and conditioning coaches, um, you know, the coaches don't get it, they don't understand, like, we just haven't done a good enough job of listening. We, we haven't done a good enough job of really listening to what, what they're saying. What are they telling us about what they value around physical preparation? Some, some of the questions I like to you know, I, I like to ask coaches, uh, what would you do if we weren't here? Because that gives you an indication of like what, what they value essentially. You know, what do you hear them talking about to players? What, what do you, you know, what do you see them, you know, what, you know, what do you see them coaching? How do they design sessions? Ask them what's the most physically demanding drill or session that you could put on and then talk to them about why that is. And then you know, the other one I like to ask is if you could give somebody an injection of a physical characteristic or a technical, what, what, what would it be? And, and what effect would it have on their game? So, so you know, I've rambled on a little bit there, but I suppose my perspective is it, in, in any relationship, there's only one, you're only in control of, of one side of it, which is you. And you've got a responsibility to listen um, and to align what your what your view of the world is with that person's if you really want to take performance forward martin do you feel differently to that or no um i was gonna kind of talk about uh the first coach i worked on the on the female side with which was mo marley and um she's a long standing long serving uh coach in the women's game like 20 plus years in international women's football so uh, like just to kind of ask her some of the questions that Ben asked when I started. And she presented to me her thoughts on the physical side of things, which is massively invaluable um, to kind of like how then I approach things with her and more broadly the women's pathway. Because I think without that, um, spending the time trying to understand her kind of ideas and beliefs around it, um, it would have been really difficult to just enforce something on them, which I think is a, a, like, what we tend to do and most certainly what I've been guilty of in the past and um, because you're like this is the way we're going to do it um but I think spending the time to understand her perspective and the other coaches perspective was massively beneficial and in the women's side of the game um there's a massive thirst for that physical um development they at some point I think that they almost value it greater than the technical which I found really hard to comprehend at first but um, yeah, like that has been massive for us uh, from the, on the women's side in terms of implementing the kind of concepts that we do and getting to the point where we're, we're starting to talk about the, the, this integrated approach to player development and having really good conversations about what that player might or might not need. Um, but yeah, investing that time early, I think, is critical. Any interesting responses to them questions, Ben? Can you think of any? If you can't, it's all right. I just thought I can't go, I can't. Well, what, yeah, what sort of things if you were like, yeah, I mean, I've asked those questions of coaches, like, I, yeah, it's the standard one, you know, if for any upcoming coach who I'm going to work with, then you know what's coming, like, the, um, um, the, um, I, I remember working in, um, it, with the women's hockey team in the build up to Rio and uh, speaking to our head coach about it. And he was talking about how he really liked how light footed the Argentinians were. 
and he really liked how um you know how you know yeah that kind of how agile but like again he talked about this lightness that they had when they were running um and also their ability to control themselves on one leg and i was like show me some drills or exercises and we did stuff like um yeah we, we did stuff like uh, attaching rubber bands and hockey sticks and reaching out for stuff and and uh, and then but it's just having the will in it. i remember there was one part of my brain going i hope no other s and c coach watched it. it was at bisham abbey where just everyone you know cleans and squats and so it was like it was well at the time anyway and i'll, I'll just hope to god no one else sees me in here because i was getting right into it but we actually it, it, it was really really useful because we ended up redesigning our speed and agility model around when we stopped calling it speed and agility training um and we developed it around the winning actions so it was like it wasn't agility anymore it was 1v1 defending and it was a 1v1 defending coaching model which had some physical attributes to it um that we could use profiling with and we can use um and we could use some of the you know the expertise that we learned from different practitioners like you know jonas came and worked with us franz bosch you know um etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm sure i'm sure there's plenty of others i think the language piece is critical though isn't it is like sometimes we come at it from our world which has a, a set of like terms and language associated with it and they come at it from their world which is the lightness that you talk about ben and like we're generally talking about the same things and this is where like my relationship with Mo, I think was particularly good is that if either one of us felt like we didn't know where this conversation was going, like we'd call it and say, look, I don't know what you're talking about right now. Like, like let's take a step back and like, can you explain that again to me? And then what you find the majority of the time is you're talking about the same thing, just using different words to describe it. So again, like I think Ben said earlier about that mutual understanding is so important in terms of like moving forward with things. So last but not least, and this, this may have been covered, so it may be touching on, on, on things that have already been said, but your approaches to physical capability development, and it might be, it be interesting to see the differences between the, the women's side and the male side. Um, do, you start, do you want to start off, Martin? It'd be interesting from the, from the, from the girls' side. Yeah, um, we approach this as a collective project, first and foremost, so... We, we identified, I guess, the challenges that we kind of talked about earlier in the in the session around like the density of the fixture program we're going to face and potentially the the gap between the capability to cope with that and the demands they're going to be um, exposed to. So then that kind of, I guess, is not the end of the story because we're still very much on this journey. But like we then started to think about how we can actually start to impact this given our constraints. And like the, the easy one to think about is uh, like what we call the chronic adapt chronic adaptive response or the car but that's the one that we probably have least control over because that requires like we talked about that consistent approach to training um so there's very few opportunities that we have in our like roles in order to actually deliver that and that's much more about how we um collaborate with our kind of colleagues at clubs and things in order to kind of um help them understand the demand that we're talking about and also help them uh like we need to understand their demand as well because that player is going to transition between both of those environments. So I'm not really going to talk too much about that because that's very much about that relationship piece. But the other part of it is um, we we looked at that kind of that, that cute um, tournament preparation period and also within tournament mode and how can we um, think about like preparing players to cope with the demand during that. And so this is where it starts to get a little bit different, I guess. Um, and we started consulting with some external experts. So some of the, the guys that um, Ben mentioned earlier around profiling were also people that we consulted with uh, for the kind of training solutions project. So we consulted with Damien Harper around um, the breaking capability side of things. Um, we um, linked up with Jonas around the sprinting capability side of things. And then we also uh, worked with Gareth Sanford around the anaerobic speed reserve concept or the our repeat and recover. Um, but then the other person that we um, added into the mix for this was Glenn Howardson um, from Northumbria University. And I guess the, where we got to in our thinking um, was around like an idea of an acute protective effect. So 
the benefits of chronic adaptation are obviously like that you raise the the overall potential of whatever structure to do what it needs to do. But when we think about um, some of the eccentric training studies, um, when they when you apply that initial eccentric bout, you get an, a, a protective effect to the secondary one. So we started thinking about how can we maybe manipulate that in order to get a protective effect to the demand that players are going to face. And we called this the APE, the acute protective effect, um, just because we like acronyms. Um, <laughs> and also it allowed Ben to uh, get a picture of an uh, APE and put him in a car to talk about the two differences, which is great if you ever get the chance to see that slide. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that was the start of it is like the concept of this acute protective effect. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about with Glenn and Glenn came in to present to us about how we could potentially manipulate that. Um, and it's probably too detailed to get into now, but it's definitely worth um, like uh, reading into that idea of the repeat bout effect and how that could apply. Like the basic summary that I remember now is that um, if you have two bouts where you apply um, a relatively high intensity stimulus to a muscle group or an action, then you get a protective effect that can last quite a long time. And that those two bouts, obviously, because they're going to be quite damaging and they need to be far enough apart and far enough away from the competition that you're preparing for. But like within a two week time frame, you could offer a level of protection that that a player might not have had prior to that point leading into the competition, which may um, minimize the damage they face when they go into that first game or the second game or the third game or that repeated level of um, kind of intensity it may minimize the effect that has on the, the negative potential of their performance decline. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic principle. I guess added to that, um, <clears throat> we started looking at ways that we can uh, apply that and what does it have to be in a one-off bout or can it be multiple smaller bouts? So um, at this point mentioned Matt Cuthbert, who's investigating this idea of microdosing for us. So if we split that training volume up over consecutive days, or if we do it in um, two larger bouts in the more traditional sense, what's the difference in terms of the adaptation that we see? Um, early signs are is that as long as volume is maintained constant and intensity is, then the adaptation or the output is very similar. So that's another useful model for us to apply. Um, <clears throat> without then getting into the details of breaking strength, I'm going to hand over to Ben to see if I've missed anything. I suppose, I mean, no. The, the, the only thing I've had, I would add is that we're starting to see, uh, you know, efficacy of, of these types of concepts, you know, within tournaments. Um, I suppose there's a couple of things with that. Like one, we've got a clear model that we can all apply within the, these situations, and that that makes it easier for everyone to. And obviously, it's been robustly challenged by everyone as well. So it means that people are more willing to commit to a model, and we can try it out. Um, and again, we've started to see, yeah, things like when we put really specific stimuluses together to develop breaking characteristics, we find that breaking characteristics improve. And when we found that we maintain intensity, so with a, one team we took to a tournament, um, we found there was a large improvement in hamstring strength and, uh, and prone iso and breaking strength across the course of the tournament using this microdosing model and applying the principles that Dane and Jonas had taught us around um, the particular exercises, which would really help develop these characteristics. Um, but we found we were giving the players loads of feedback around the intensity they were delivering within those two exercise, those those types of activities. But for the repeated hop, uh, we found there was that remained the same, and in some cases declined throughout the tournament. And when we look back at the exercises we gave, we didn't give them any feedback from it when they were doing it, so they had no way of knowing whether the intensity threshold was being broached. Um, so we, I suppose the, the message from that is that we're finding efficacy with with the model and with the principles that we're applying. Um, and the other one is, uh, I suppose, coming back to an earlier point, is around session design uh, to maximize to make sure that each session really, really counts, and that if we are trying to broach a level of intensity, uh, that that we get there, um, and the consistency as well. I think the other advantage. So there's two more things. Apologies. The um, <laughs> the advantage that the microdosing model allows you in a team sport environment is that 
it's okay to you might miss a session because there's a niggle there's an injury there's you know what someone just doesn't fancy it on that day and and it's okay because you've only missed two sets out of a total of 20 that you were going for whereas if you take the more traditional approach and they don't fancy it, they're injured or they can't deliver the intensity on that day you might miss 50 percent of the work rather than 10 percent of the work the other side of it is something that we've stumbled across is the gamification of the training environment. Um, and I can't think of a session which I've run in the last four years now that hasn't had a gamification element to it. Um, and the reason, and I've become really, yeah. And, and the reason being is that it stimulates intensity and within the time we, we, we're not working with players for long periods of time, working with short periods of time. We don't have the benefit of, you know, them trying to, learn and understand what things could or shouldn't feel like over that prolonged period of time. We have to teach them how things should feel within a short space of time, get them to deliver it. Um, so we found gamification, you know, using technology or just using simple, stupid races or competitions and constraining the tasks and make sure they can deliver those things effectively. Really, really important. That can either be you versus me, 1v1, um, whole t you know whole groups you know defenders versus forwards um we find what works really well is trying to do groups of threes or four so like total scores of something how many reps can you do in this period of time how long can you hold this how far can you collectively jump and we found there's essentially there's competition between groups competition individually but there's also accountability to the group as well so people always want to perform so we found that that from a session design and coaching perspective, the gamification, and we have like, we make silly competitions, we theme them as you can imagine, um, and um, to try and make it interesting and exciting as well. Um, uh, that allows to uh, enables us to retain consistency and intensity and specificity, with um, which are kind of three principles which can allow you to to adapt. Anything more to add there, Martin? Um, yeah, just something Ben said earlier in that piece around how the project was developed, like when the project was de developed, we were never going to cater for every situation that a team going to a tournament faces. So I think what's really important to recognize about it is that there were a set of principles developed and there were examples to illustrate if you had 20 days lead in versus like five days lead in and what you could or couldn't do because you're never going to like be able to run that same program twice, even if you had the same age group twice, like it's it just different every time. So the principles guide like how you would do it. And I guess the other part of that is coming back to the power of the, the group. So like what we've encouraged is that if you have um, a plan for your team is present that to the group for that check and challenge. And then that allows that kind of group kind of, okay, well, have you thought about this? Have we thought about that? And that it goes a long way to, um, like making sure that we're trying to prepare those players optimally for it and making sure that it's not just, I think this, I'm going to do that. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the additional point, which I think is really important to how that and most of the other projects work as well. And um, what's the uh, thing that Bryce says is a Christmas tree approach. So you, you get to <laughs> like, we're creating uh, like a framework that you can apply rather than it just being, here's the package off you go type thing. Um, because, like I said, we're never going to cater for all the different circumstances that we see across all the teams that we uh, look after. Um, to go more in detail around the breaking and the sprinting and the repeat and recover, the, the breaking side of things is split into, um, well, the breaking and the sprinting is split into strategy and um, like the strength side of things. So we make a differentiation between um like how they might execute a task and then also like their underpinning strength quality so from a sprinting perspective um we spent quite a bit of time with Jonas um looking at um how people execute drills and how people sprint and things like that and how we can make that more efficient because i think that's a really important part of it as well as just the strength inside of things and then obviously from the strength inside of things we link it back to the profiling of looking at um, hamstring strength is it above or below the threshold that we think is appropriate to cope with the demand that they're going to face? And so it gives us a really clear way of working and um, utilizing like the profiling system and also observation of how they move in order to create a package for them. Um, I guess 
One of the most interesting ones is the repeat and recover side of things. And we relied heavily on Gareth Sanford's work um, and using the idea of looking at their maximal sprint speed and also their maximal aerobic speed, we essentially create four categories. So if you're very fast, but have a low aerobic, we categorize you as a flyer. Um, so when we come back to that idea of Icarus, what's going to really hurt this player and cost that player is probably performing lots of aerobic set, aerobic work. So if they've had a game or a series of training sessions where their aerobic demand is high, then we probably need to think about how we manage that player. Um, but then also, like if you're trying to develop that across a tournament, is how you implement um, a relatively low volume, consistent dose of probably pretty low intensity aerobic just to raise that capacity or at least not let it drop. Because that's one of the other things that could happen is detraining during the tournament period if you're constantly in this cycle of performing and then recovering. So like making sure that we, we take care of that. Um, other categories are hybrids. There are kind of like favorite ones because they have the best of both. They have good peak speed and they have good maximum aerobic speed. What you tend to find is those guys tend to cope with most things pretty well. Uh, then you've got what, what we call diesels, which is relatively low peak speed and high aerobic. So those are your workhorses. But what potentially could hurt them quite a lot is that uh, um, if they have to do a lot of high speed running because they're operating close to their max or if they have to do a lot of sprint work. So how can you kind of um, make sure that they're exposed to that continue through the course of the tournament in order to, if they get that demand in the game, they're prepared for it. And then the last one is, Unfortunate in that you're low in both. Um, so th that's a real. <laughs> <laughs> We've got other attributes. Great break. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a challenging one because if they're an important player, is how do you how do you prepare both of those things to cope with the demand they're going to face? Um, and so just by categorizing those players and the reporting system helps us do that quite quickly. We can start to pick out like our groupings for certain aspects of our. Um, training, um, which I think is really valuable to individualizing, which again helps with that buy-in from the players and buy-in from the coaches, because the coaches can see that player is different to that player. So, like, why are they doing the same thing? And I think that that separation is important from that perspective as well. Anything to add, Ben? Finally? No, no, you've absolutely covered that one. I was waiting for my category to pop up at the end. <laughs> Bring up the rear. <laughs> Bring up the rear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the running club. Yeah. I will not tell you what we <laughs> called it originally. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been we've been here for an hour and a half with my technical issues at the uh, at the start. So thank you very much to you both for for coming on. Really do appreciate it. But finally. Martin, if anyone's got any questions based on what we've said or anything else about what you guys do, where's the best place for people to contact you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. Um, I can tell you my Twitter handle right now. How are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't go on it very frequently, but uh, I will message it to you later, Rob. <laughs> That's fine, mate. That's fine. I can link to it. Ben, same as you? Uh uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm on at, at Ben underscore Rosenblatt. Um, no, honestly, mate, honestly, guys, thank you very much for coming on. Really do appreciate it. And uh, thanks for giving up some of your Friday night to, to have a chat. No, look, look, thanks so much, Rob, for allowing us to um, to come on and share some of our experiences. And we hope they, we certainly hope they resonate with, um, with people in the physical prep community and really welcome any further discussion. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. <laughs>